Introduction to Orthopedic Trauma for OR Staff. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series Version 5. Slides are by Dr. Hans Christoph Pape, and this is Sakib Rahman narrating, and this is the third and final video in this slide deck. We already talked about um, uh, t terminology. Um, we talked about uh, you know, fracture patterns. In the last video, we talked a lot about um, screw design, implant design, uh, plate and screw function. Um, so a lot about um, implants. Um, and uh, now we're going to talk a little bit more, more about x-rays and then how we put, th put everything together with um, imaging and fracture fixation. So um, I'm going to talk about alignment, bones, cartilage, soft tissue, the ABCs of x-rays. So alignment. Um, most joints have oftentimes two fairly congruent joint surfaces. Uh, if you think of um, the knee, for example, uh, you have the distal femur and the proximal tibia. They're supposed to be congruent or, uh, and, and, and if they're not, we would say there's malalignment, for example, uh, because they're not congruent or not uh, align properly. Um, most joints in the extremities have that sort of convex ball side, for instance, like the distal femur and the concave cup side, like the proximal tibia, or for instance, the proximal femur and the acetabulum cup. Um, so if we think of that example, when there's anatomic alignment, that ball of the femoral head is centered in the cup. So subluxation is when one joint surface in relation to the other side is displaced. So there's partial loss of continuity. So it's like that joint is not fully dislocated, but it's not congruent either. So it's on its way potentially to being dislocated um, or partially dislocated. And we call that subluxed. As opposed to dislocated means that there's a complete loss of continuity of the joint surface. So for example, here's some ample ankle subluxation. Uh, you could argue there is still some uh, continuity of the tibia and the talus here, right? Uh, and, you know, the talus is not like sitting all the way back here, for example. That happens sometimes with certain ankle injuries. But this is also not normal, right? This is supposed to be in contact with this here fully. Um, as you can see here, ankle has been congruently reduced and stabilized um, and a plate and screws was used to maintain this. You can see the fibula was fixed and there are multiple screws actually holding the fibula to the tibia in order to, uh, in part, make sure that this relationship is all congruent. Here's an example in the midfoot or what we call lis frank injuries where the lis frank joints are dislocated completely, right? There's no part of any joint that's in continuity with its opposite articular side. All, and this is a little more complicated to see here uh, if you're not used to looking at these, but this is a midfoot dislocation. Here we can now see, at least on one view, you know, that those joint surfaces have, have been reduced uh, in some kind of congruity um, and stabilized with wires. Here's a knee dislocation where you can hopefully identify here. I mean, the proximal tibia is here, the femur is here. I mean, this is completely dislocated. You can see the femur is like behind the tibia completely. So this is not just sublux, it's completely dislocated. And this, by the way, is a very dangerous problem. This is um, a risk for arterial injury. Um, here is a subtalar dislocation, right? So the ankle is actually reduced, but the subtalar joint is not. So this is a uh, subtalar dislocation. Um, diastasis is a term you may hear us use frequently for something like the pelvis, right? So it's a displacement of one joint surface relative to the other in a slightly movable um, or synarthrodial uh, joint. So when you have this like widening here in the pubic symphysis, um, we often will maybe say there's diastasis. Um, some people will also say dislocation, but uh, when there's sort of this widening here in the joint like that, we may use that term. And in this case, the diastasis has been reduced uh, and then stabilized with the plate. And you can see posteriorly, there are also some iliosacral screws. So um, radiographic abnormalities in the bone usually fall into one of the following categories. So either there is you know, an abnormality in radio opacity, right, determined by bone density. So we may see a lucency. 
uh, or um, an increase in bone opacity in, indicates like sclerosis or there's more density. Uh, we may also see an abnormal contour or abnormal size or shape. Um, so if you are um, concerned about a, uh, you're seeing a lucency that could indicate a fracture, right? So a lot of times on fluoroscopic imaging, intraoperatively, we're looking at something and we realize hmm, that looks like a lucency. Maybe we didn't see that before. That's because we're worried there's maybe a, a fracture that's propagating uh, beyond where we thought the fracture ended. Um, Focal lucencies can, um, like just a little round area of lucency, uh, could be a tumor, infection, a bone cyst, uh, very diffuse lucencies that are much more widespread, uh, could be an endocrine problem, metabolic problem, could be a tumor. So let's talk about, let's look at some x-rays and talk about fractures and fixation. So here's an example of an iliac wing fracture and a lot of orthopedic um, conditions, you can um, use symmetry as a guide. So we look at the other side and that does not look right. Um, there are multiple fragments here. And you can see this has been treated with open reduction internal fixation. And I suspect that this is a fracture that's probably already since healed. We can see some additional heterotopic bone there. Or perhaps that's some of those smaller fragments that coalesced. And that's using internal fixation with plate and screws. Here's a tibia pilon fracture uh, involving the joint surface and the distal tibia. So that fracture has been reduced and stabilized with a thin wire ring external fixator like we talked about in the last um, uh, video. Uh, makes the x-rays very difficult to see, obviously. So this becomes very challenging when you have so many, um, so much uh, metal essentially blocking your x-rays. Here's a supracondylar femur fracture, and you can see probably a, some kind of total hip arthroplasty stem or some kind of stem in the femur above us. So we can see uh, there's some independent, possibly lag screws here. There's our plate and screws here. Maybe there's some locking screws down here. Um, and then we can see, it looks like there's a cable here too, right? So a lot of different implants being used to fix this fracture. Tibial plateau fractures. This is where you can have a, um, a depression here, perhaps that we talked about in the first video, where there's a joint depression where the distal femur falls into this and creates this kind of a pothole. Also, this widening of the condyle and lots of uh, comminution here as well. Uh, and this is fixed with open reduction internal fixation using plates and screws. Many, many times this may need to be done uh, both medial and lateral. Uh, here's an example of a proximal humerus fracture that you can see um, that was fixed with a locking plate and screws. And you can see that this is an example where the um, fixation has um, not held the reduction, um, as you can see here. Uh, and, and sometimes we can see screws that penetrate into the shoulder joint. So a lot of times when we're fixing these, we're trying to make sure that we're not uh, penetrating the joint surface initially uh, when fixing proximal humerus fractures. Here's a clavicle fracture. You can see right here, very wide displacement, um, risk for non-union, risk for dysfunction with that much displacement treated with open reduction internal fixation with plates and screws as shown here. Here's an example of a uh, trimalleolar ankle fracture. So there's a medial malleolus Right? There's a lateral malleolus fracture. Sometimes you don't see it so well in the AP. And then what we can also recognize here, it looks like there's a posterior malleolar fracture also. So this is a one of the common fractures you'll see is a trimalleolar ankle fracture. And that is fixed with, uh, you can see some partially threaded screws here, uh, probably acting in lag technique. Uh, you can see some additional lag screws here, another lag screw here. This is probably a neutralization plate and screws on the fibula here. So a lot of the terminology we talked about in the last video, uh, you should be able to apply to describing what was done here. Here's a humeral shaft fracture uh, treated with open reduction internal fixation. Here you can see there are two plates being utilized. So to summarize uh, our last three videos, um, 
We're working with implants. Um, we're uh, trying to avoid uh, contamination even more so than in um, soft tissue cases. Uh, so um, working under sterile conditions requires a lot of care, communication, and uh, uh, a little extra special um, attention to sterile technique, especially because things get very crowded in the room and you have to be even more careful than usual for that reason as well. Um, we talked about bone biology. Um, bone has metabolic and mechanical roles. We talked about fracture healing uh, a little bit. Uh, and uh, we talked about the ABCs of how to understand um, uh, basic fracture interpretation. Uh, we talked about uh, implants, a lot about screw and plate design and um, the different types of uh, implants that you may see used. And uh, we went through some x-rays to understand um, how fractures can be fixed. There's some references I'll leave up here if you uh, want to uh, look a little bit further um, on orthopedic surgery and orthopedic trauma surgery in the operating room. Thank you very much.